Welcome back to Econ 321. Today we're going to start talking about supply and demand, two fundamental concepts in economics. These will be the topics that we will be covering in Chapter 2. Supply and demand curves, equilibrium, quantity, and price, adjustments to equilibrium, also called comparative statics, some welfare properties of equilibrium, we're talking about free markets and the poor, price supports, the rationing and allocative function of prices, determinants of supply and demand, predicting and explaining changes in price and quantity, and finally we will end with some algebra. So to start with some definitions, first we'll define a market. A market consists of the buyers and sellers of a good or service. Later on, we will define a market on specific products. For example, you could have a market for salmon. You could have a market for king salmon, sockeye salmon. Your market might be in Fairbanks or around the world. It really depends how you define the market, depending on what you're studying. Then we will get into one of the more, most famous laws. A law in economics is generally what is observed to be true. So the law of demand is what generally observed to be true with empirical data. The law of demand is specifically the empirical observation that when the price of a product falls, people demand larger quantities of it, all else equal. So without anything else changing, if the price falls, people demand larger quantities of it. Firstly, if the price rises, people demand less quantities of it. The law of supply is also generally what's observed to be true, and that is, is the empirical observation that when the price of a product rises, all else equal, firms offer more of it for sale. And conversely, when the price decreases, suppliers are willing to supply less of it, so the quantity supplied will decrease. Okay, let's get to our first example. This is a demand curve. It comes from your textbook on page 27. And this product is lobsters. So on the vertical axis, we always have price. That's true for every demand curve. The price is always given in dollars per unit or some currency per unit. On the horizontal axis, we have quantity. This is also always given in units. In this case, it would be units per day. You might have units per year or whatever it happens to be. Already this demand curve tells you quite a bit. It tells you we're looking at lobsters. The price is the price per lobster. It could be the price per lobster tail if that happened to be what we were looking at or it could be the price per pound, however you want to define it. And we also have quantities and quantities is in thousands of lobsters per day. It could have been lobsters per day, it could have been thousands of lobsters per year, but this is defined as the price per lobster, thousands of lobsters per day. So when you look at this demand curve, you already know that we're looking at a daily demand for lobster and we're looking at the relationship between price and quantity. So lots of dimensions here. It's a point in time. The point in time is day. It's a well-defined market. The market is for lobster. It's this price right here, and this price is going to be a real price. We'll talk more about this later, but a real price is a price that has inflation removed. So it's a price relative to all other prices. And one other thing to think about when you look at demand curves, you can always add this. All else held constant, or all else held equal, sometimes I'll say. So this is looking at the relationship between the price of lobster and the quantity of lobster, the relationship that would hold if nothing else was changing. These demand curves just don't happen, they're estimated. If you take Econometrics 227 or Economics 227, you will estimate some demand curves. A lot of the work and research that I've done, uh, particularly in fish, I've estimated demand curves. 
the way you estimate demand curves, what you might have is a series of points like this, and you estimate that that demand curve goes through those points, and you use statistical analysis to get the best fit. In this class, we won't talk about how these demand curves are actually estimated. We'll just assume that they exist. So you may have seen demand curves before in your other classes. Let's go ahead and look at the different interpretations. One interpretation is a horizontal interpretation. That says if the price of lobsters was $8 per day, you would predict that there would be 4,000 lobsters sold per day. So one useful thing you can do with the demand curve is to a, do a prediction. In this case, we are predicting how much is being sold given its price. And conversely, and conversely, when the price decreases, suppliers are willing to supply less of it. So the quantity supplied will decrease. Let's look at the vertical interpretation of demand curves. The vertical interpretation tells you if the quantity is poor, the most consumers are willing to pay to have four sold on the marketplace is eight. We've talked about this before. It's the maximum they're willing to pay. They would like to pay less to buy 4,000 lobsters a day, but if 4,000 lobsters a day is going to be sold, the maximum they'd be willing to pay for that is eight. This is also considered by economists as a benefit. It's a benefit of the final good, and in fact, it's a marginal benefit. Because as we measure off the demand curve, we're measuring this point right here. Consumers would be willing to pay more if less of the good was on the market. As more of the good on the, comes on the market, the price starts dry, dropping. This point of demand curve is the benefit of that 4,000th lobster per day, or that last lobster sold. Because it is the price of eight that will clear that very last lobster. Some consumers would have been willing to pay 12. And at 12, you could sell, say, 3,000 lobsters, or about that amount per day. But at a price of 8, consumers will buy more. So 8 is the marginal benefit of selling that 8th lobster per day. Again, this is the law of demand. Price drops, demand increases, price increases. Demand drops. Any point of the demand curve is the benefit of that good to society, and it's the marginal benefit of that last unit sold. I thought it might be fun to give you a real-life example of a demand curve. I'm a fisheries economist, and I've done a lot of work on Alaska fisheries. And this is one example I have on Pacific halibut. The first step of estimating Pacific halibut revenues is to estimate a demand curve. So this was a talk I gave back a few years ago. This is now about 10 years old. But this is a demand for Alaska halibut. And you can see it has all the common features we've been talking about. First of all, it's 2002, so this is the time period I'm looking at. It's an ex vessel demand, so that's the demand in fisheries, ex vessel means the demand right off the vessel. So this is the demand for halibut right off the vessel. You can see in the vertical axis, I have the units. It's US dollars per pound. These would be real prices. And on the vertical axis, I have landings. That's a quantity supplied in millions of pounds. And you can see that this curve, which is a demand curve, is the downward sloping demand curve, like we've been talking about. What we did was we estimated the demand curve. And so, for instance, this year, we were looking at landings about in this range. And so the vertical interpretation will be if you had to clear about 60 million pounds, the price would be somewhere around the $2.20 per pound level. If landings were to, say, increase dramatically, we could predict where prices would end up and if they're to decrease dramatically, we could also predict those prices. 
So fisheries is very important to look at the demand curves because as harvest fluctuates, you want to have some handle on what the fishermen are going to receive for the halibut and the subsequent then health of the um, halibut fishery will depend much on how the prices are moving around. So this just gives you one uh, a real life example and to actually estimate this demand curve and other things we did is, is quite a complicated process and took us about two years. Next we're looking at supply. So demand was on the consumer side. Supply is on the supplier side or the producer side. Again we have a market here for lobsters. We have the price on the vertical axis. Same thing as the demand curve. Dollars per lobster. And we have quantity on the horizontal axis. Same thing as before. The quantity of lobsters per day. So every market you're looking at the units price and quantity will be the same for that particular product. So we have a point in time, well-defined market. Again, it's the real price of a good. All else is held equal here. And the supply curve can be estimated using econometrics. Okay, we have a horizontal interpretation as we have before. And the horizontal interpretation says, if for instance, the price is $20 per day, then we will predict that 5,000 lobsters will be supplied per day. Okay, if the price is less, producers will produce less lobsters. If the price is more, producers will produce more lobsters. The vertical interpretation is that if 5,000 lobsters is to be supplied per day, the minimum amount that producers are willing to accept to supply this entire quantity is $20 per lobster. They would like to have more than $20 per lobster, but if it was say less than $20 per lobster, like $16 per lobster, they would only supply 4,000 lobsters per day. So the least they would be willing to accept, and we've heard that term before, willing to accept the least compensation they need to supply for, uh, 5,000 lobsters per day is $20 per lobster. This again is a marginal cost. It's the cost to supply that last thousandth lobster. So if the price was $16 per lobster, they would supply four. Incrementally, you keep raising the price and until you get the way to get that last lobster is the price would have to go all the way up to 20. You could supply smaller amounts of lobsters for less dollars, but marginally, the way they get that last lobster onto the market, the price would have to be $20. So $20 is the marginal cost. This then is the law of supply. What's generally observed to be true is that as the price of a good goes up, producers will produce more of that good and as the price of that good goes down producers will produce less of it. This is when things start to become interesting because once you have supply and demand you can talk about equilibrium quantity and price. This is the price quantity match at which both buyers and sellers are satisfied. If they are not satisfied you will have excess supply that would happen if the price was higher than the equilibrium price and it's the amount by which quantity supplied exceeds quantity demanded. If the price was lower than equilibrium price, you would have excess demand. The amount by which quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied. So equilibrium price and quantity here is when price is 12 and quantity is 3,000 lobsters per day. So what I'm going to do is put a little E on top of the P. That says that this is an equilibrium price because price can be anything of course. But when we're in equilibrium, the price is going to be $12 per lobster. And then the equilibrium quantity, we'll put a little E over that and that's going to be 3,000 lobsters 
per day. So this right here is equilibrium. And so we're going to talk about why this is an equilibrium. What happens if the price was higher or lower? But here in equilibrium, producers want to produce 3,000 lobsters per day. Consumers want to purchase 3,000 lobsters per day. And if you have a market which is well functioning and there's no outside interference into it, the price and quantity will automatically become to 12 and 3,000. So the equilibrium price here is 12 and 3,000. What happens if the price was above equilibrium? 16. In this case, if the price is above equilibrium, producers want to produce even more. In this case, producers would like to produce 4,000 lobsters per day. But at the higher price, consumers want less. So consumers at a price of 6 would only be wanting to buy 2,000 lobsters per day. So excess supply, we'll call ES, equals 4,000 minus 2,000 or 2,000. So that is excess supply. Now, if the market is free to react, what's going to happen? What you're going to see is unwanted inventory accumulation. All of a sudden, the suppliers of lobsters are going to have a lot of lobsters left over at the end of the day. Well, that's not good. Unless they're going to freeze it and sell it later, they don't want lobsters left over at the end of the day. They know they're producing too much. So to get rid of this excess inventory, they would have to start lowering prices. As they lower prices, it's going to be a signal that in the future, producers are going to produce less lobster at that lower price. And as that lower price, consumers, however, are going to be consuming more lobster and it will continue until we get to this equilibrium point. What happens if price was lower than the equilibrium price? In this case, let's say the price was $8 per lobster. At this low price, consumers are happy. They would like 4,000 lobsters per day Producers, however, don't want to produce as much lobster. They would only want to produce 2,000. So excess demand would be the quantity demanded at a price of 8 minus the quantity supplied. We're going to make this different from the last problem. This would be quantity demanded. This would be D, quantity supplied, and that's going to equal 2,000. So you had excess demand of 2,000. But what's going to happen? Well, producers are going to see that consumers are upset. They want more lobster. They're lining up for lobsters, but they've run out. That will be a signal for suppliers to begin raising their price. As the price starts going up, producers are going to want to produce more and catch more lobsters, but consumers are not going to want to eat as much new lobsters. And again, we will end up with the equilibrium price of $12 per lobster in 3,000 lobsters. Let's take a very quick look at the welfare properties of equilibrium. If price and quantity take anything other than their equilibrium values, however, it will always be possible to reallocate so to make at least some people better off without harming others. So here's an example of this. Let's say that the price, for whatever reason, was $16 per pound. The amount that actually would be sold, interestingly enough, would be 2,000 pounds. Remember, there would be 4,000 pounds supplied, 2,000 pounds demanded, so you have this excess supply of 2,000. But what's actually sold is, in this case, whatever consumers are willing to buy, and they're only willing to buy 2,000. Okay, well, at this point, at $16 per lobster, consumers are willing to pay $16. Let's call this a marginal benefit. It's measuring the benefit of the lobster to consumers. The most they're willing to pay is $16. So let's say that's the benefit to a consumer. Well, at this point here, the 
least a producer is willing to accept in terms of compensation to produce 2,000 pounds of lobster per day is eight. So that's the marginal cost. So the benefit to consumers of lobsters is 16. The cost to produce those lobster is only eight. So you have an opportunity here for a welfare gain or for trade. Consumers are valuing the lobster at about twice as much as it costs the producers to actually produce. And if you went on in economics, you would recognize this triangle as an opportunity to capture additional value. So as long as the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, consumers value the lobster more than the value of all the resources it takes to produce that lobster. And so we will tend to move up into equilibrium. And so that's the welfare implications here because society can be better off producing more lobster in terms of how people value them. That is in a well-functioning market. Moving on to our last topic for this lecture is what happens if prices aren't allowed to move towards equilibrium. Sometimes the government decides that equilibrium price is not what they want to happen. One way that this happens is a price ceiling. So this is the legal maximum that the price is allowed to move up to. If it moves all the way up to the price ceiling, then it is stopped by law. An example we're going to talk about here in terms of price ceiling is a pretty famous example, and that is one of rent control. So here in this example, we have supply and demand of apartments. This is per month. The rent is dollars per month, and the quantity is the number of apartments per month. So equilibrium here, if it was allowed to happen, you would see the rents being $600 per month, and the number of units of apartments is 60,000 apartments per month. And of course, this would be in some geographical location. It's another important thing I haven't really talked about. When you define markets, where is your market? If you have a market for apples, let's say, is it in Fairbanks? Are you talking about the market in the United States, the world market, whatever it happens to be? Okay, so back to rent controls. Prices want to move to $600 per month, but we have a price ceiling. So you can think about the prices move up and up and up. They hit the ceiling. You bump it with your head and then you stop. So the government has decided that rents cannot be more than $400 per month. Why might the government do this? For a variety of reasons, they might be trying to help people who cannot afford $600 per month. So they're trying to lower it for the, uh, especially for poorer people. Or they might, of course, be trying to win elections or a combination of different things. What happens when you stop at $400 per month? You create excess demand. You can also think of this as a shortage, a shortage of housing. Because here at $400 per month, consumers want 80,000 apartments per month. There's only 40,000 available. So excess demand is 40,000 units. There's a huge run in apartments and they're just not there. In fact, this shortage is an artificial shortage. So you've created this huge excess demand for apartments. What are some of the ramifications of that? Well, people can't get apartments. There's a shortage of housing. People who are willing to sell apartments at that very low rate because there's such excess demand, they don't have to do upkeep on the apartments. They can practice discrimination. So many people want it, they might only sell it to people who are just like them. There is also a, um, a black market that will form. Sure, the price is only $400, but you won't get my apartment unless you give me an extra $300. Just don't tell the government. So all sorts of bad social ills can happen because of that. Things that would not happen if the price was allowed to go up to the equilibrium. And you can read more about those in your textbook.
Another way in which you can interfere with free prices is through a price support. So that's a legal minimum that prices can be sold at. Price ceiling is legal maximum. This is legal minimum. It says prices cannot drop below this price floor or the government will make sure that they stay up to that level. One of the most common price supports is in agriculture and that is that many times if you have a uh, subsidy or a price support that the government will buy up the extra product to secure that price. So for instance, let's say this is the price for the soybean market in equilibrium should be at 300 there would be 300,000 tons of soybeans sold per year. Well, the government decides that price is too low. They might decide it's too low because they have voters in those regions and voters want higher prices for the goods. Or they might decide that too much farmland is being uh, changed into commercial land so they want to keep the prices high and production high. Or possibly they want to keep the production high because we could hit times of famine or times of war and you want excess supply. But whatever the reasons, if you thought about this price coming down, it hits this floor and legally the government is not going to allow it to go down lower than that. So how can they do this? Well, at 400 per ton, producers want to su supply that much. Consumers want to demand that much. So this whole amount will not be sold on the free market. So what the government will do is they will come up and purchase it. Here consumers are purchasing 200. The government produces another 200. So you have total purchases of 400 and to induce the suppliers to produce 400 the price would have to go no lower than $400 per ton. And So this is a classic example of the price support and of course, where does the money come in to buy these additional 200? They come in through your taxes. And they come in through taxes that you would not normally be spending on soybeans. Because if you would, the price would be up to 400 anyway. You would have done something you considered better with your money. But the government says, no, you can't do what you consider better with your money. Instead, we're going to buy additional soybeans. And you should note in terms of welfare implications here that at this level the marginal cost, the cost to society of producing that last ton of soybeans is $400 per ton. The benefit is just 200 So at this level price support the marginal cost is greater than the marginal benefit. If you think of the marginal cost as the cost to society of producing these soybeans, the marginal benefit being the benefit to society of consuming this last uh, few tons of soybeans, then this whole area here, as you move beyond equilibrium price and quantity, the benefit to society is less than the cost. So this would be considered inefficient, but it's supported for reasons which don't have to do with efficiency, whether you agree with them or not. So that ends what we have for lesson four, and we will move on to lesson five.